it's, it's my endeavor. It's, it's something I've been uh, really trying to be better at, not only in church, but in my life, is to be mindful of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Because when you get busy, somehow, that's one of the first things that gets pushed aside. Your, your, your mind gets clouded with so many things that the things of God can be pushed out very easily. I find when my life is in order, I think of God all day. When stress comes, baseball practices and building projects and housework and all that other stuff, somehow you can, you can just get pushed away. I have a question for you. When do you suppose most people think most about their retirement fund or their account or their plan. When they're ready to retire, 63. 63, 65. Well, the, that's, that's probably very accurate. What do you think one of the first thoughts are when somebody hits 65? Matter of fact, it probably starts a little bit earlier, at 55, because you're thinking... Uh oh, is it in place? And then when you finally get to the place where you want to retire, one of the regrets you might have is, you know, there's not enough of my retirement fund. I can't retire. So you didn't quite plan well enough. Some people will hit that age and have nothing except for public assistance, which really, you really can't live anywhere. It's human nature to think about what's in front of you. It's human nature to forget sometimes things that have, people have done to you. I'm going to read a scripture in Deuteronomy 31. It says, when I, have brought them out of the land, when I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and, I, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. As I look around and I see some of the newer believers, the, the baby believers, and I see the, the look in their eye, the hunger for God's word, I'm watching the way they're worshiping, and then I look at some of the people that have been around for a while. We got to be careful that we don't get too familiar with the things of God. That, old, that new car smell, you know, kind of wears off. One of the questions I could ask you this morning, what do you suppose would happen in church if you came as prepared to receive as I prepare to deliver a message? Did you just show up for church today? I mean, thank God you did. I mean, I'm grateful that you're here. I got, you, once in a while, you need to just come up here and look out at the audience and watch people praise. It blesses my heart to just see people. I just know people going through some things and they're, they're just singing out and telling God they love them. And I'm just sitting there. It's just a matter of time before they're free and that's in their past and it's done. And, you know, it's, it's awesome to be able to see that. And, you know, I'm going to make sure that I'm not preaching to the choir. You know, you guys are here. You know, last week was Easter. <clears throat> Everybody came. <clears throat> One week later, you know, it's half empty. We had standing room only last week. Where is everybody? But, but you're here. So we're celebrating the ones that are here. And I'm talking to people that if you're here, that obviously you're committed to the things of God. So again, when, when we think about our future, our retirement program, it's, it's when you're 65 years old and you retire, and now, now you have to live on, on, on very little. You're going to wish you did more. You're going to wish that the young version of you did more to take care of the older version of you because the older version of you sometimes just not able to work anymore. I'm going to read a scripture that is read, that I have read many times at, at funerals. And, and if you think about it, why wait until then? Revelation 14, verse 13. It said, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed is he who dies in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works will follow them. 
You know, we hear the phrase, you know, you can't take it with you. Well, that may be with material things, but there are some things you will take with you into the afterlife, your works. And it doesn't necessarily say only your good works. When I read that, I was like, wait a minute. That means all the gossiping, all the backbiting, all the bad attitudes, you know, it's like, who were you while you were here on earth? I know we're going to be rewarded, rewarded according to our good works when we get to heaven. So, so eternity, there's basically a, an eternal 401k plan. And, and what, are you, what are you investing in that? Are you investing most of your time being very nearsighted, dealing with mostly what concerns this life? Are you living a life that when you die and you stand before Jesus and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, and then the rewards get handed out. There's a song that says, it'll be worth it. Are you going to be glad that you're like, wow, I'm glad I listened? My, one of my main goals, one of my main gifts as your pastor is to just keep challenging you and not to let you get lazy, to keep pointing to you to the, to the future, where we're heading not only us, but where everybody else is heading. I, I mean, sure, we want to teach the Word, but you guys need to dig into the Word on your own. I love when I see study, people studying the Word of God, and they talk to me, and I can lead them and guide them. And, and, and listen, I was, went to Bible college, and, and I, I read so many of Brother Hagin's books and the principles of what we need to live on this earth. I have them on the inside of me. You know, we, we have to live by faith. And if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, well then, based on how much you're reading the word, I can tell you how much, where your level of faith is at. And there's no way around it. And if I did all that reading and built my faith up for today to get through one circumstance, and then I stop reading, when I'm over here, guess what? My faith is not there anymore. Faith is not a one-time thing. We, we sang the song about keeping your eyes above the waves. It's reference to, I'm pretty sure, but it fits if it's not, Peter. Jesus told him to walk on the water, and he kept his eyes on Jesus, and he walked. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, Jesus and looked at the waves, and what does the waves represent the problems in your life? As soon as you took your eyes off Jesus, and you looked at the problems in your life, he started to sink, and so will you. So basically, what is faith? Faith is... First of all, knowing what God said. You can't have faith if you don't know what he said. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you don't know what he said or you're confused about what he said, you can't have faith. Second part of faith is believing what he said. Believing what he said above what the world says. Believing what the Bible says and what Jesus said above what the doctor said. Believing what the Bible says above what your teacher says. Believing what the Bible says above what your past keeps screaming out to you. I'm telling you there's voices in this world. Anyone who is not yielded to the Spirit of God, there's a good chance that a lot of what comes out of their mouth is not going to be inspired by God, but from the unseen realm. That's why there's teachers that tell you, Gino shared something yesterday, and, and I, while he was saying it, I was going to share something too about an experience he had in school where a teacher just handed him his test and said, are you stupid? That kind of stuff doesn't happen too much today because they go right to court. But my second grade teacher, because I was reading with my finger, called me stupid and put me in the corner. And guess what I did to that? You think I'm stupid? You watch me now. Now I'm going to be the bad kid. Because I'd rather be known. You know what? And then years later, they, just, they started teaching kids to read with their finger. It helps them. So she was stupid. <laughs> but I'd rather be known as the bad kid than the dumb kid. So then I, I listen, I had a serious problem growing up. You want to talk about a ball of energy 
uncontrollable, I mean, just, I would drive people crazy. My aunt couldn't sit down and eat this, in a meal in the same room with me. She said, I can't. My feet were going, my hands were going. I'm putting food in my mouth while I'm eating. I said, Dad, can I go out? I want to play basketball. Can I be dismissed? I... It's just, it was insane. So instead of trying to restrain that after that situation, I let it loose. My first grade teacher who just recently passed away, I went to her, her wake. She was at my ordination. She was at my 40th birthday. She's a believer. So we see the contrast there <clears throat> of the different voices in the world. She loved me and I knew it. She learned how to take that ball of energy and direct it in the right place. She always gave me a job to do. She said, do you think you can help me with something? I remember clapping the racers to clean them. You know, will you, will you erase the blackboard for me? She gave me something to do with my energy. I couldn't just sit still, don't you say a word. <laughs> I have a list for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a big list, too. If anybody wants to eat lunch at our house and bring a shovel with you today, you're welcome. <laughs> I think I wore out Victor yesterday, so he can cross him off. Oh, my goodness. So blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, and their works will follow them. So, so what are the works that are going to follow us? What my first grade teacher did in my life. She's dead right now, and she's in heaven. And, and, and what she did for me is, is on her record. That's pretty awesome. You realize you could be doing something, and it's not the Lord's will, and you'll get no credit for it. You know, if God said to me, I want you to be a pastor, and I said, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't deal with people. And I decided to be an evangelist. Yeah, I'll get some reward because I've preached the gospel, but it's not going to be the same as the obedience of saying, Lord, here's my life, use me. Amen. So we need to be more heavenly-minded than earthly-minded. We need to realize there's two kingdoms, and we don't belong to the kingdom of this world. Amen. It's funny how kingdom, uh, as children of the king of kings who live in a different kingdom. Can you imagine a real kingdom with a real king and has a son who's a prince, you know, kind of living in the village and living according to their... They don't do that. They realize they're a prince. That's my castle. Anything I want, I have. It's mine. I need it. My dad's the king. So many children of God who are children of the king are living like mere men. And you know what, sometimes those kind of statements, you know, I mentioned, you know, the, the ten spies who said we can and the two that said we can't, I mean, the two said we can and the ten said we can't. When you make a statement like that, the ten flip out. That's not humble. Listen, in order for me to be effective for the kingdom of God, I cannot live like a pauper. And I'm not talking financially. That's part of it. I cannot be spiritually poor and be effective to help other people. Amen. There's a place for you to know who you are in Christ. Again, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, in Christ, because of Christ, there's no pride in that. But why think less of the work that Christ did? It's not a lack of humility to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's, that's not false. That's scriptural. If you think you made yourself the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, then that's wrong. But I could say, I'm righteous. What do you mean? You never make mistakes? They love this teaching. They have so much material. Oh, these people are arrogant. Who do they think they are? You know who I think I am? I'm, I think I'm someone who's been washed in the blood of Jesus. Amen. I think I'm the person who Jesus took my sins and put it on the cross and took his righteousness and gave it to me, and that's who he made me, and if he made me that, then you argue with him. Amen. If that's what the Word says I am, then I am. 
That's what faith does. It believes what the Word says about you. We are living in a messed up world. We are living so clearly in the, the proverbial frog in the water. We're living it out. You put the frog in the water, in boiling water, he jumps out. You put him in cool water and turn it up little by little, he'll stay there until he's dead. Years ago, and they still make fun of him, whether they were preachers or politicians back then, because there wasn't that much of a difference years ago. Many of the men who founded our Constitution and all the laws we live on, were, they used the Bible as their guide. So many of those men, when they started to see certain things happening in society that would hurt us, they make them look like crazy people because of, they were complaining or saying something about some of the things that were going on in the movies. The, the, the what is it, the FCA, the FFA, the one that, con FCC, the one that controls what's on TV. Look at where their standards have come down to. Years ago, unmarried couples, married couples couldn't be in the same bed on TV. They were worried about what our kids saw. You could turn on the TV any time of day now and see things you don't want your kids to see. So where do, where, what part do we play in this world? Do we just go to work, do what we have to do, and take care of ourselves and, and not fight back this worldly system that's pushing us back? Last week we celebrated Easter, or Resurrection Sunday. One of the things I was talking to about with Holly this morning, and, you know, well, first let me read the scripture. In 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and your faith is use useless. Well, what does that mean? If Jesus just died on the cross and didn't raise from the dead, you would have no basis for your faith to work for you to have your sins forgiven. The Bible says you must believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he's raised from the dead. That's a key point in your salvation, that he has risen. I was telling Holly this morning, you know, we had it for a lot of years. We were watching the Passion of Christ on Good Friday. And we did it year after year, and then things got busy. We said, we're going, going to do it this year. And we said, you know what, let's, let's take a year off. But I didn't feel right about it. If we didn't want to watch The Passion of Christ, I mean, if you really want to appreciate Sunday morning, you need to have a Friday night. You, you can't be out just doing whatever you want on Friday night. And I mean, you really need, every year, you really should take the time to honor what he did on the cross for you Good Friday, they call it. I mean, you could get religious about it, but then again, you could go to the other scale, the other end of the, the spectrum. But, but Friday night is when he was crucified. He was betrayed. He was beaten badly. You know, when I think about, it's the song, when I think about the Lord and what he's done for me, he took a severe beating on my behalf. Remember we started out about human nature to take things lightly and to forget about things that were done for you and, and, and when things are bad and you're hurting, you, you, you come to church every week and you're crying out to God. Then when you're better, then you know, a couple of weeks later, you know, you're like, should I go to church today? I, I don't know whoever thought that church was an option. <laughs> Imagine doing that at your job. I don't know, I got a lot to do. I don't think I'm going to go to work today. Why is church an option and work isn't? I mean, just think about that when you realize the sad state the church is in and why we're not living in the victory we need to. Now, I know things come up. And, and it's a shame that this world has decided that Sunday morning is really a good time to, to play sports with your kids. And, and I know... Holly and Ralph, you know, their daughter's tearing it up, boy, I tell you, she's, and, and you don't want to hold her back, 
But, you know, my wife and I, when, when Deanna was playing softball in the tournaments on Sunday, there was, there was weeks we didn't go. There was a week where she went and I didn't go. Then there was a week that I went and she didn't go. So, so we kind of worked it out, and there's times when things like that come up, but it's not like, well, today's the first day of spring. It's the nicest day, and I'm busy all week long, and I'm tired. So, you know, I, 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 I deserve a break today. <laughs> Church is not McDonald's. Burger King, you deserve a break today. McDo McDonald's. Listen, <laughs> when it comes to food, my memory's probably a little better. No. You, you don't remember when we were kids, though. You deserve a break today at McDonald's. Yeah, Burger King is have it your way. You want me to sing the song for you? You deserve a break today at McDonald's. Yes, it's definitely McDonald's. That's all right. So, where do we go with that? I'm, again, I don't want to preach to the choir. You guys are here. You know, it's a beautiful day and you're here. So, I'm not talking to you when it comes to that. I'm just talking about the overall attitude towards the things of God, the scriptures. First of all, you have to learn to love the word of God. You are going to have to fight to keep the Word of God at first place in your life. If you are not purposely every day and doing something to make sure that the Word of God has first place in your life, human nature is going to make sure that that falls away. And the world we're living in, you know, it's funny, people say, well, the, the miracles passed away with the apostles because they needed it to get the church started. Listen, we need it more than they did to finish this thing up. Amen. So last week we celebrated the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. What happened when he rose from the dead? One of the things we have is, is your sins are forgiven. That's an awesome thing. But that alone is just not enough. Even if just having your sins forgiven and then one day you go to heaven... There's so much more than what was done on the cross than just making, giving you the, the pass to heaven. It's, it's probably one of the major things. One of the things that happened when, when Jesus forgave your sin, he made a way for your relationship with your Father in heaven to be restored with you. The Father wanted that relationship restored with you so much that he allowed his Son to die for it. So how can we take that lightly? The other thing that happened when Jesus died and rose again, it was the beginning of the church age. The book of Acts started. One of the main characteristics, one of the main uh, benefits is, is the work of the Holy Spirit in the church age. You know, this is a book, I still haven't read it all the way through, I read parts of it, but all I need is the title, Good Morning Holy Spirit. Be mindful of his presence. We're going to start looking at the work of the Spirit in your life. And on Pentecost Sunday, which is the last week of May, we have a guest speaker coming in. I try to push him off because we have... Several guest speakers coming in. When is Michelle coming? May 11th, we have a, a girl that sings at Rama. We're going to have her come in and do worship with us. And then we have Shekinah Glory coming in. June 10th and 11th, my birthday. You're all invited to my birthday party. <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday night, put it on your calendar, Pastor Jack's birthday, Shekinah Glory. You're invited. If you don't come, I'll be insulted. And then Gary Crow, June 28th. So when this guy called me and he was recommended from another preacher that I respect, I looked at my calendar and went, now is just not a good time. <clears throat> you know what? Sometimes we make decisions in our head, but at work I was thinking, you need to have him. 
but I don't even know him. Never heard him preach, don't know who he is. Something decides that you need to have him. He called me, I didn't call him back, called back, apologized. listen, I'm sorry, I'm busy, I'm praying about it, I'm still trying to figure out, you, you understand it, it costs money to have guest speakers come in. There's airfares, hotels, food, and it, it, it is a cost to having someone come in. And, and they come in basically say, and they make a living off of preaching. When they come in, we receive a love offering, and that's all they ask for. Whatever it is, it is. They don't give me a set price and say, this is what I'm going to charge you. But there was something on the inside of me, and this is what he told me. He said, first of all, he's a, he's a Jewish believer, and he said, he's going to share about Pentecost from the history of the Jews. I was like, yeah, that sounds good. The first one I thought of was Harriet. I said, if I don't have him for anybody else but Harriet, I'll do it. But there was just something on the inside of me. What are we talking about? The Holy Spirit. My head dismissed it. The finances dismissed it. I had all these reasons why this wasn't a good time. And then I started... Listen, this is the way we do this. Then I started thinking, well, since he's kind of in the area, it's going to be cheaper. And God said, listen, you stop figuring out, have the man in, don't try to negotiate his fee, pay for his airfare, get him in, he needs to be here, and that's it. So we're going to look, and we're going to end with that week of really celebrating Pentecost Sunday. For those of you who don't know who that is, what that is, when Jesus died on the third day, he rose again, and he spent some time on earth. The Bible says he appeared to more than 500 people. He met his disciples. He was on the beach, and they were fishing. They didn't recognize him. They see a man cooking on the beach. That's why I love him so much. He's going to have a big feast in heaven for us, too. And when Peter recognized who it was, he jumps out of the boat and runs to him. But he was here for a while. And then one day they were there, and all of a sudden he just went, Shoop! and they're all standing there going, wow. He was here, he left, now he left again. And then the angel said, don't be amazed. The same Jesus that you just saw rise the same way he left, he's coming back. But one of the things Jesus said when he came back, one of the first things he did while he was here, when he appeared to his disciples in the upper room, it says he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which some people believe. Because the baptism of the Spirit didn't happen until the day of Pentecost. They were with, they, they, before Jesus rose from the dead, he was with them. The Spirit of God was with them. But he said, after I die and I raise again, not only will he be with you, but he will be in you. That is one of the major works through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is not only having the Spirit of God come upon us, and this is where people get confused, and this is why we want to talk about some of the things of the Spirit so you're familiar with what's happening. You know, the Bible says when two or more are gathered, he's there in the midst. Well, isn't he always there because he lives in us? There's a difference between your relationship with God, which now that we experience it, mostly our relationship with God is through the Holy Spirit Amen. on the inside of you. That's how he communes to you, not to your head, not with an audible voice, although he can and he has, but we're instructed, the Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. That's how he's going to lead us, through our spirit. Amen. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ made a way for us to have the Holy Spirit live on the inside of us. But there's a difference between that relational part of the Holy Spirit and the gifting part of the Holy Spirit. When he, when he comes upon you to do a job or he anoints you with, with one of the gifts of healing or, or one of those that as somebody needs it, that anointing comes upon you and then you lay hands and, and that, the Bible says, is as he wills. I can't decide, even if the gift of healing rests on my life on a pretty regular basis, I can't decide, okay, I'm going to do it today. But what I can do is take you to Scripture, show you what the Scripture says, and if you'll believe it and we agree, it'll be done. Amen. The gift of healing, which is, is an anointing from the Holy Spirit, His presence coming upon you, 
Brother Hagin said he remember praying to a, with a lady in a wheelchair, and she stood up, and she said, I can't believe it. Well, obviously, it wasn't her faith. And their faith has nothing to do with it when the gift of healing or the gift of, has nothing to do with the person receiving. But Brother Hagin did say this, which was interesting. He said he'd rather pray the prayer of faith with somebody, show them in the Word of God what it says, and have them believe the Word of God and get healed because then they can get healed anytime. If they just learn how to get healed through the gifts of the Spirit, then they always need somebody to come and lay hands on them. Kind of like, you know, you teach someone to fish, they could fish for life. You feed them fish, they only eat while you're there. That's why we need to be students of the Word, not only for ourselves. You can't say, well, I'm not sick, I don't need... No, somebody else does. So when you run into them, you need to be familiar with the Scriptures so you can say, here, this is what God said about your situation. How would you like me to pray for you? Amen. So the first thing that happened when Jesus died and rose again, he comes back to the disciples, he breathes on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. He's now living on the inside of them. But he tells them this. You wait for the promise of the Father. And in that day when he comes, he said, I'm not leaving you orphans. I'm sending you another one just like me. And the statement that he made, if you'll ever really meditate on this, that is better for you that I go away. You, you really got to spend some time thinking about that statement for it really to mean something. I mean, think of the whole situation. Who he was talking to, where they came from, what their professions were before, how he answered their problems, how many times they did the wrong thing or went to do the wrong thing and he was there to correct them. He actually told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't say Peter. He spoke to the devil even though Peter was there. <laughs> he, he just looked right past Peter, Peter and said, Satan, I know you're behind what he's saying. Boy, if we can get a hold of that statement. If you stop getting mad at people, I mean, Jesus did it right there. He didn't even consider that. He understood that Peter was being used of the devil, and he addressed the real problem. Get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't say, Peter, how can you say that? <laughs> Peter must have been, call me Satan. <laughs> but he said, it's better for you that I go away. And they're thinking, you know, all those things that we get wrong, you're here to make it right. What do we do then? The people are coming to see you, not us. All of this is going to end. No, but he made statements all along that they just didn't get. Greater work shall you do because I go to the Father. Then even the works that I'm doing, you'll do greater works. And guess what? When he died and he rose again, and on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came on them, they did works. Peter walked down the street, and his shadow fell on people, and they were healed. Amen. So all the things that they thought and were afraid that wouldn't happen anymore because Jesus was gone, they did. So the words of Jesus became true. It's better that I go away. Because while I'm here, I cannot send the promise of the Father. You can have the Holy Spirit come upon you, but you cannot have the Holy Spirit in you. He says, it's better that I go away. So we want to take the next couple of weeks, you know, especially in light of the series we kind of just finished up, and like I said, you could plug anything into that series. We talked about the Bible saying before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a great falling away. We looked at certain things. The Bible says, you know, those who think they're strong, take heed lest you fall. There's constantly warnings about humans not forgetting. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. That tells me if God has to warn us so many times, he warned the children of Israel, when you get into the promised land, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Then he says, when you get there, you're going to get fat, you're going to, and then you're going to worship other gods. Come on, let's be different. I've played on a lot of sports teams, whether it was baseball, basketball, swimming, football. And, and it's funny how there's different teams. Sometimes you're on a team, they just don't care. I am not a... What's the guy who makes fun of women? I'm not a male chauvinist. I'm not... A, I'm not but there is one thing about girl sports that I've seen almost every time that baffles my mind. The game's over, they lost, and they're like, hey, hey. I'm like, dude, you just lost. 
The bus ride home after some of our games was the most miserable place on earth if we lost. I mean, it takes me days to shake it off sometimes. <laughs> Somehow you're not getting this. I don't want to be okay with failure. Losing is not acceptable to me. The Apollo mission, failure is not an option. I'm not going to let you forget that we have a job to do. And I know life gets in the way sometimes. We looked at some of the things that the devil tries to, to, to pull you away. What, what did he do to all the people that were here last week to get them not to come this week? I, can't, I would love to hear some of the stories. I mean, there was standing room only. And they're not here today. So somehow, I can't believe that everyone that was here last week has something that important that they can't be here this week. One of the biggest things he uses is offense. There's some people that aren't here and not coming to church, and they decided not to come to this church even during this message was being preached. That tells you how crafty the devil actually is. So we wanted to give you some tools about how to stay strong, you know, believing the word, reading the word. We saw the devil tack the word of God right from the beginning with, Adam and Eve and saying, did, did God really say that? Does the word really mean that? So we need to be knowledgeable. But one of the keys, and this is where we're going with this, it's not enough. First of all, you have to be reminded that, hey, better men and women of you that have fallen, so you need to be careful. The day the Bible says pride comes before the fall, the day I think I can't fall, I'm in trouble. The first thing I do is just be honest with God. God, this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm feeling. This is... I need you to help me with this. Somehow we just justify some of those things. We just need to be honest with God. But it's not enough to just know the things that might draw you away, which you need to be pointed out, and then you won't get caught off guard. But the best way to make sure you're not going backwards is if you're going forwards. If your car is in neutral and you're on level ground, you probably won't go anywhere. But this world is not level ground. This world is tilted backwards. You know, sometimes, depending on what kind of a hill you are in when you're driving, sometimes if your car's in drive, you pull up to the red light. If you're on level ground and you take your foot off the brake, guess what? You'll go forward. Then there's a certain pitch where if you take your foot out, off the brake, you don't go anywhere because there's enough momentum, there's enough horsepower, even with the car idling, to keep you at that place. But if you tilt back a little bit more and you let your foot off the brake, you'll actually roll backwards even though your car is in drive. So many Christians are pointing in the right direction, but they're literal, literally going backwards. They're Christians, they're going to go to heaven, they're hand, but, but they're, they're not making progress. You know, you just look at people. They used to be in church every week, now it's sporadic. They used to... You know, when they got saved, the joy of the Lord was there. They were pleasant. They were, everything's good. I love everybody. Now, all of a sudden, it, they, their old nature has crept back in, and they're, they're divisive and gossiping, and, and, and they, they, they've kind of, kind of gone backwards. If you're not working to go forward, you know, the same, I've used the illustration about being in, in a stream in a canoe. You could be facing this way, but if the water's rushing that way and you're not paddling, guess where the current's taking you? If you're not working as a Christian to go forward, your chances are you're going backwards. And the problem is when you get to a point where you get backwards to a certain degree, it becomes real easy just to turn around and go with it. And, and the devil's a deceiver too. Have you ever been at a red light with your foot on the brake? And then the car next to you moves, and you think you're moving? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, he's convinced a lot of people they're moving, and they're really standing still. We have an eternal destiny. One day we're going to stand in front of the King of Kings, and I'll never get tired of telling you this. I know you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to look into his eyes one day. 
I am going to look into pure love. I am going to look not only in, but I am going to see the world the way he saw the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. I am going to see that in his eyes. I am going to see his love that he had for those people I didn't like. I am going to see or, or know that the people I didn't like, when I look in his eyes, I'm going to know how he felt towards them and go, man, I shouldn't have treated them that way. My love for him has to change the way I love people. They don't deserve it many of times. People will use you. They will hurt you. They will take advantage of you. They will think you're a sucker. But when I get to heaven... The only one that matters what thinks is going to look at me and say, thank you. Amen. Well done. We're, we have a, a, a destiny. And one of the main reasons, and this is where we're going this, with this, the work of the Holy Spirit, we have to be moving forward. The only way we're going to overcome the evil that's in this world right now is, is by going on the offensive, not the defensive. We cannot wait until there's a storm to start singing about keeping our head above the storm. And if your head is above the storm, it's, you need to start helping somebody else who's drowning. There's always something to do forward. Let me see if I can find that scripture. We'll pick up next week. But I do want to... James 4, 5 says this, or Do you not think... That the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously. That is talking about a deep, it literally is talking about the same thing that an, a, a drug addict goes through. A passion that's just, God's desire for you is just so, that deep. His desire for the lost world is that deep. And if I love him, and I'm spending time with him, when I see people that are hurting, I can't just hold back. I can't say it's somebody else's responsibility. If I see somebody else going to hell, I can't just sit back and say, well, they, won't, they don't want to listen to me. My God, the Holy Spirit. One of the things we're going to look at is, is how to recognize the voice of the Spirit. I had a chance to speak with the youth group and somebody asked a question. I wish I would have recorded that because that was good. I could have just played the video and said, here, this is what, you have. but I, it, it'll come back when I'm there. But one of the th main things you need to realize is that it's a still small voice. And if I am talking with the same volume I'm talking now and I'm giving you instruction, that means life and death for you or somebody else, as long as we're walking together. But what happens if I keep walking and you decide you don't want to walk anymore? Eventually, you don't hear my voice. And that means you're not hearing the instruction that's critical to your life and to somebody else's life. So the key to hearing the voice of God is close fellowship with him. Most of the time, he'll speak to us through the word. So another key to hearing the voice of God is knowing the word of God. 